eat and shit in the courtrooms in heaven. Because we were told that the, the judgment was shit from the what? From the dead to the what? To the living. Friends, we need to understand the times we are living in. We are living at a time like never before. And I feel that God's people need to understand the, the urgency of the matter. You know, the Bible says that knowing the times, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Friends, this is no ordinary times. And I expect people of God to be hungry for the world. We need to um, understand the seriousness of this matter. The last time we looked at um, this subject about the shaking. And we're able to Understand that in heaven, in October 22, 1844, Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin a work of investigative judgment. And we're also made to understand that in this judgment, only those involved are those that are professed belief in Christ Jesus. And in those judgments, names are accepted and names are rejected. In the book of Revelation chapter uh, 3, we are made to understand that God decided to send a message to his people in order to prepare them for what to soon to come upon the world like an overwhelming surprise. Friends, the message of God in the book of Revelation chapter 3, as we saw the last time, is to awaken us to realize the times we are living in. God understands that in, in, in the near future, there is going to be a judgment of the living that will begin in the heavenly sanctuary. And so, he decided to prepare us so that we can understand our state and our condition. So we can change from sin unto righteousness. Revelation chapter 3 verse 18 to 19 says, says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Gold of faith that has been tested. A faith that has been tried. Gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, Christ righteousness. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of the nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eyes are the spirit of the assignments. So that we can see and understand the issues for these last days. It's not a joke. This is a message that God has for you and I at these last days. Friends, just like I said, the judgment started in 1844. October 22nd exactly. But this judgment started with the dead. Starting from Adam. Look at what Ellen White says. In the book, First Selected Messages, page 125, paragraph 1. She said, In 1844, a great high priest entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of the investigative judgments. The cases of the righteous dead have been passing in review before God. The cases of what? The righteous dead. So the, the cases started with the righteous dead in 1844. Starting from all the way from Adam, names are called. Their cases are investigated to see whether they are hypocrites or true believer in Jesus. All the way down through the history, on and on, names are called. Cain, uh, if Cain also believed, he is, is called. Names, Abel, all of them are called in this judgment, going down through history. 
But then she says, when the work shall be completed, judgment is to be pronounced upon the what? The living. This is interesting, friends. You know, the dead are dead. And the dead, it means their records are closed, right? But for the living, they are alive. And so, when the living are judged, they are judged Why alive. When the, the records are still being written. And that is, that's what makes this period interesting. And God says, and that is why God had to send the Laodicean message for you and I. It is for us to be prepared for this judgment that is about to come. It says, I know your works, you are neither hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, said, I will spit you out of my mouth. And we are told that the shaking has already begun. But in the future, in the very near future, there is going to be a great shaking that the side of faith of every living person in the world, every living believer in Jesus Christ in the world. And God is preparing you and I for that period. Second selected message, page 81 says, The Lord has shown me clearly that what? The image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their what? Eternal destiny will be decided. So yet she says that before this great test, that will make the eternal destiny of you and I to be sealed. What must happen first? The image of a beast will be formed. Now, when I look at, when you talk about test, what is a test? It's an assessment. Are you understanding? So when they test you, is to assess you whether you're what? You're prepared. And he says, she said that it is this great test that will decide the eternal destiny of every living professed profess believer of Jesus Christ. So that tells me that I must be ready for those tests. The Bible in the book of Revelation 13 revealed to us how this great text, this great examination we are called. This test is not for the dead. This test is for the living. Revelation 13 from verse 11 to 18 begins to reveal to us a picture about a power that will come upon the world and will try to enforce on us a mark. From 11 it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, you are Adventists. We are Adventists. We understand those prophecies. Revelation chapter 13, from the beginning, talk about a sea beast. A beast that comes from the, from the sea. And we know that to be the paper sea. And this beast did a lot of things to the world. But then, but there then came another beast. And this is uh, talking about the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 verse 11. And it says, This beast was coming up out of the heads. And it had two horns like a lamb. Two horns like a lamb. What does the lamb represent? Jesus Christ. You know, uh, John saw Jesus Christ come. He says, behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the what? The sins of the world. So this beast, this second beast that came up from the earth, it looks Christ-like because it had two horns. And we have been told, we've, we've studied this over and again in, Ad, in, in, in Adventism, that the two horns, which Daniel revealed, all represent what? Kingdom. So this beast that looks like Christ in a way must have two kingdoms in it which Christ instituted or which Christ supports. What are those two kingdoms? Well, you find out that there was a time in encounter with Jesus Christ where Jesus Christ mentioned this startling statement. He says, give to what? Caesar. What is Caesar? To what? God. What is God? 
in the Bible, God has a kingdom. And, it's, and this kingdom is his church. But also, God recognized the kingdom of the states. And so, this lamp-like beast has these two kingdoms, are you getting it? Within itself. Church and state was separated. That's why it had two arms. And so, the, 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 or some people call it Protestantism and what? Republicanism. And that is why this beast, according to prophecy, is the United States of America. And that is why when America was founded, it was founded on the principle of separation of what? Church and what? And states. Protestantism and republicanism. But then the Bible says, though it look uh, lamp-like, with its two on, it will speak like a what? Like a dragon. Friends, this is what the Bible is revealing to us. That in the near future, America will contradict its founding principle. Instead of being like a lamp, it's going to what? Speak like a dragon. You know, when they call some, uh, when they talk about uh, some powers, they call them the draconian powers. What do they mean by that? When they say uh, the nations are draconian, they are trying to enforce things on people. Are you getting it? Trying to enforce some principles on people uh, in a tyrannical way. And that is what America is prophesied will become. To us like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. Then the last verse says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dread therein to worship the first beast. Now this second beast, this lamp-like beast that comes from the earth, the Bible says it's, not going, to, it's going to be doing the bidding of the sea beast that came before it. Which is the papacy. Whose deadly wound was healed. Then the next one says, And it disfeared them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make a what? An image to the beast. Now remember, we just read it. Ellen White says, Before this great test, the what? Image of the beast will be formed. And I believe strongly that this great test is the judgment of the living. I believe that when the judgment has shifted from the dead to the living, then the image of the beast will be formed. I believe it so strongly. Because when uh, you are judged, is your eternal destiny not sealed? It's definitely sealed. And they should say that that is what is going to take place before your eternal destiny is sealed. He's saying this second beast, it makes an image to the beast, to the first beast, which is the papacy. Making an image. What is an image? What? When they say an image, it's, a, it's kind of like a reflection. I like that. A reflection. So it's reflecting or copying the what? The first beast. And so what America will do when it forms an image to the beast is uniting what? Church and state. It, it copies the first beast, which had been wounded by the sword and did live. Now listen. It says, and it, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. So friends, a time is coming. When we are going to be killed, a time is coming. When this beast will try to kill you and I. If we are alive at this time period, and I tell you, as, uh, as events in the world are going, I believe that this event is so near that we even believe it to be near. Just look at events in the world. Look at, look at the past few years, what has taken place in America. Now, America has majority Catholic justices. Majority Catholic justices. Look at um, the, the, the Congress filled with a lot of Catholics. The, the same thing with the Senate. 
And so we need to understand that we are, we are living an unprecedented time. So you need to understand that this is not something that is so far away in the future. It is something that is close. And God has sent us a message, a shaking, a straight testimony to prepare, to shaking us off, to wake up from our slumber, a lukewarmness, so that we can be alive and see, to be able to discern the truth of God's word for those last days. You need to be prepared for this. The judgment of the living is not going to be a joke. Your life is going to be on the line. It says that uh, as many as will not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And that is going to happen because the word of God never fails. Manuscript Relief, page 169, paragraph 2 says, The image to the beast represents the form of apostate protestantism that is why I add this lap like horns, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power, Protestantism, which is the church there, and seek the aid of the civil power, which is the state, for the enforcement of his dogma. That is when the image of the beast will be formed. Friends, we need to understand that there is something broader happening. You know, a lot of time when we talk about the, with the mark of the beast, we are always looking at what is happening on the earth. We forget what is happening in heaven. Remember the judgment started in the day 44 and the judgment shifts from the dead to the living. But now when the living is, has begun to be judged, they need to be tested because they are, the, they, are, they are living. Now listen to this. The living, how can God, when he says, your name is accepted in heaven, how will, how will the angels be sure that this person, after his name has been accepted, will not rebel afterward? Do you understand what I'm saying? How can they be sure that they won't rebel? How can they be sure that they won't continue sinning after the name has been accepted in heaven? So God allows a great test for his living. A test, a final test that shakes the heart of man. A test that can only be passed when you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. A test that can only be passed when Jesus has been whole in hold for you. A test that can be passed when Christ uh, is your righteousness. A test that can only be passed when you, you, you are so much dependent on God. You've been crucified with Christ. This is no ordinary test, friends. And that is why you need to understand that when you are still having issues in your life, you've not fixed those issues by the blood of the Lamb. It's no, you're not going to pass this test. You need to have crucified yourself in Christ Jesus to be able to pass this final test. It is a mark of rejection. It is a mark that seals your destiny. And that is why we need to understand what this is all about. It says, and it causes all, both great and small, this power. This is what is happening on the head. But at the same time, something is happening in heaven. So there is a simultaneous work taking place both in heaven and on earth. It causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to receive a mark on their, on their right hand. The right hand, which is a symbol of your action, the works you do. And on their forehead, this is the place where your mind sits. So a lot of people will receive this mark on their right hand. Even if they don't believe this mark, yet, because they cannot buy and sell, they are going to receive it on their right hand by their works. Why some will willingly accept this false teaching by the beast? They will first receive this false mark, which is not of God. And the Bible says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is going to happen. A lot of people say, it's not going to happen in America. America is a democratic nation. This is not going to happen. But friends, when God says it, you better believe it. The word of God is sure. And as the word of God has said it, so it will be. The Bible says, here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding. 
counts, or some say calculates, the number of the beast. For it is a number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. We all know what this means. So we are not doing an intense study on this at all. But Bible says, let us count the number. Let us look at this number and assess it. Friends, this is going to happen. And we know that this, this number is representing the Roman Catholic Church system. So what is this mark? Would, if you want to understand the mark, it's called the mark of the beast. What do you think you need to know first? You ask yourself, who is the beast? Because if you don't know the beast, how are you going to know the what? The mark. So you have to know the beast. And we know through the story of the book of Daniel, chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, that this beast, this uh, little honor uh, Daniel, and the book of 7 doesn't Lonia, chapter 2, calls it the man of sin. The man of sin. The little on. The, the, at the period of the abomination of desolation. This beast is what? The papacy. And so what mark does the papacy ask? First, you need to also understand that this mark of the beast is the counterfeit of God's mark. It's a counterfeit of God's seal or sign. And so when you understand what God's mark is, it becomes so easy for you to understand what the mark of the beast is. Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 to 12. Where Jesus Christ warns us about not receiving this mark. And the Bible says, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, then he says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Immediately after he says, if any man receives the mark of the beast, then he says, here is the patient of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandment of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. So this tells me that aside from these people that receive the mark of the beast, uh, against this, in contrast to this group of people, there is a people different, unique, and they keep all of God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Now this tells me that the mark of the beast must have something to do with the commandment of God. Is it not true? Because if it says, well, if you are keeping all of God's commandment, then you must not, you must be doing something right. If you are keeping the commandment of God, then it, you must be, be a, you must not, you must be rejecting the mark of the beast. So the, the mark of the beast must have something to do with the commandment of God. And that is why we need to look at this. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16 says, Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my what? My disciple. Seal the law. The seal, which is, a, which is synonymous to the mark or the sign, is connected to the law once again. It says, seal the law among my disciples. Where well, the book of Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 20 says, Hallow my Sabbath, and there will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the what? Lord your God. So yeah, the Bible, historically, from Genesis to Revelation, reveals to us that God has a mark. God has a seal. God has a sign. And this sign is the what? The Sabbath. You better thank your God that you are in this church. You better thank your God that you are part of this group of people. This movement of destiny. This movement that is repairing the bridge. That is repairing the bridge in the law. This movement, seven day Adventism, that has brought life to the law of God. Bringing back the rejection of the seven day Sabbath that has been trampled by man on the foot. Thank God we are part of this movement. Thank God we are part of this people that receive the seal of the living God. Because the Sabbath, the Bible says, it is a sign of, of sanctification. It is a sign to identify who God is. Francis. The same thing, Exodus 31, verse 13 says, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. For it is a sign between me. You need to understand, the Sabbath is that unique. We we play and joke with the Sabbath a lot. And we need to understand that God holds this in utmost importance. God regards this Sabbath. In fact, the book of Isaiah 66, 22 to 23 tells us that from the new heaven and the new earth, that we shall keep the Sabbath. 
even in the earth renew. So the Sabbath is God's sign, God's mark, God's seal that identify who He is. When they talk about the seal, a seal has three major elements. It has the name, the title, and the territory. And that's what a seal. For instance, in the ancient days, when they talk about seals, you know, they put a seal on a document. It serves as a sign of authority. And when the seal is there, you know it's authentic, right? And that's what the Sabbath is. And that is why the Sabbath is at the center of the law. The first law of God, the first four commandments, relates to our love for God. Why the last six relate to our love for our neighbor? Right there at the center, you find the seven-day Sabbath. And there, that is the law that reveals the name, the title, and the territory of the law. And that's why the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all the work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. We need to understand these are critical. The Sabbath day. It didn't say a Sabbath day. It says work six days. Keep that day only the seventh day. But here we find the remnant of God's people. Those that are supposed to error his message. Those that are supposed to be unique, to be different. They are seen breaking God's holy Sabbath day. In the Old Testament, the, the uh, breaking the Sabbath day leads to death. And so we need to understand the holiness of this day. The holiness, the solemnity of this day. It says in it, you shall not do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughters, nor your male servants. No, your female servant, even your servant. In, I mean, look at it. No, your katsu. Now, maybe you call it your cars. Something you used to work, right? I mean, we need to understand. I'm not saying you don't drive car or something. Of course, you go to church. But you understand? So you don't work, you use it for, if you're using your car for business, you don't do it. Well, that's what they do. They live in an agrarian system. So it said, no, your stranger, who is within your gate? So which means when you have a visitor in your house, they need to keep the Sabbath. Unless they can stay in your house. Because it says, your stranger, who is within your gates? Friends, the Sabbath is God's sign. Then it says, for six days, the Lord, the name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh, made as the creator of the world. That, that is his title. The heavens are here. That is his territory. That is God's seal, which is found within God's law. And so Sunday... Is the opposite. Are you understand what I'm saying? So the mark of the beast, I'm not going to show you all of those references from, but you need to understand. And that is why uh, in, in history, we are told that Constantine, uh, which is uh, the emperor of Rome, he was instrumental in bringing what we call Sunday sacredness. He, he united with the Catholic Church during that period. And they changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. They rejected the principles of God's scripture. And so as a result, the Bible says a time is coming when the mark of the beast, which is Sunday, will be enforced on you and I. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 15 verse 9, because some people say it doesn't really matter which day, but God says when you follow man's tradition, says and in vain they worship him, teaching as doctrine the commandment of man. It matters what we do. It matters what we believe. We must always live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We can't say because that's how we met it. No. What does the word of God say? We can't say that is what they've been doing in this conference. What does the word of God say? We can't say this is how... I mean, we, we need to follow the scripture and not traditions of men. In vain they worship me. Teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. So there in heaven, aside what is happening, God is investigating the living. And the seal of God that is going to be placed on us is a seal of God's acceptance. The seal is given to indicate to us that we've been, our names have been accepted in heaven. Now let me, let me give an example. When you have a, a document, like I said, you now put the what? The seal upon it. That seal, like I said, is a seal of what? 
that this document is mine, right? It shows that this document is mine. It has, it has been sealed. So the same way in heaven, the seal, when it's placed, it's a sign that our names have been accepted in heaven above. As the Bible commentary says, those who are sealed are what? Are God's slaves. And the seal upon them is his what? Attestation that they are indeed his what? His own. So we always concentrate on what is happening on the earth. We need to look beyond, beyond the earth and see what is happening in the courts in heaven. The seal of God indicates that we are God's own. That our names have been accepted in the courtrooms above. What a joy. But even though they don't know, but heaven knows. And that's what matters. The nothing about the seal is this. Apart from it being a sign that we are God's own, it's a seal of having character perfection. And I'm telling you, friends, you won't receive the seal of God if you have one sin you've not repented of. This is a fact, friends. Remember, like I said, your name has been accepted in heaven because you've overcome sin. You are now part of God's kingdom. So the seal of God is affirming that character perfection has been achieved through God's grace in your life. Selected messages, book 3, paragraph 427. She said, Are we striving with all our God-given powers to reach the measure of the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus? Are you striving? There's going to be a strike. It's not a joke at all, friends. You, when you are preparing for an exam, you know how you prepare. You burn the candles in the night. You got people that do sport, they exercise in the morning. They jog. I mean, these people are doing it for an earthly glory. They are ready to sacrifice time, sacrifice the pains, sacrifice and do all to get this earthly glory. But how come we that are living in these last days at the time of the investigative judgment, are not striving with all our God-given power to reach the measure of the stature of men and women in Christ. Why are we not striving for the peak glory? Why are we not striving? She says, are we seeking for His fullness, ever reaching higher and higher, trying to attain to the perfection of His character? Are we striving? It's a strive. You must strive. You must walk it. You have, but you can't do it in your strength because you must be seeking God's grace all the time. Oh, pray to God, please strengthen me. I am weak. I don't have all it takes. It requires all of this. Those are the acts of grace. It is not your own works because you don't, you can't do it. Now, listen to what Shana says. When God's servants reach this point, which point? Character perfection. When God's servants reach this point, they will be sealed in their forehead. The seal of God affirms that you've attained character perfection. Not by your power, but by God's grace. Wow, what a beautiful thing. The fact that I, a sinner, I, a sinner, born with a sinful flesh, I, a sinner, that I've committed so many sins that I've lost count of. High a sinner that I've lied. High a sinner that I've done all sorts of atrocity. One day, God can renew me. One day, God can change me. One day, God can make me to grow in character to, his, to the fullness and perfection of Christ. Wow. And God says, when God's people reach this point, they are sealed. In their forehead. So it's a seal that affirms that God's people have achieved character perfection. Now look at again in Bible Commentary, Volume 7, Paragraph 970. It says, Who will be sealed? Those who have a Christ like character. It's not just something different. You must be like Christ. Christ in me, the hope of glory. The seal of the living God will be placed upon those who bear. A likeness to Christ in character. Those are those that will receive the seal of God. Testimonies for the church 5, that's 216. It says the seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious. 
one loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women or false tongues or deceitful acts. All who receive a seal must be without what? Spots before God. Friends, don't mind those people that tell you you will sin till Christ come. Heresy! This is not, that is not biblical. The Bible says those that receive the seal of God must be without spots. You can't sin yourself to heaven. You can't continue sinning, sinning. Sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent. I mean, Jesus will get tired of you. You need to overcome by His grace. Provision has been provided for you and I. We don't need to remain the way we are. Sin, repent, sin, repent. No, that is not the gospel. The gospel transforms. The gospel does not transform some things. It transforms fully. Uh, Matthew 1, 21 says, And she shall bear, give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For she shall save his people from what? From their sin. He didn't say he's going to save you in your sin. Anybody that tells you that you are going to be sin to Christ come, is telling you, uh, he's telling you a lie from the pit of hell. You can't sin to Christ come. Christ is coming to take to, to take what? To harvest the fruits. If you are not the fruits, if you are a seed at that time, you are lost. It's not coming for the seed. Have you seen where the Bible says it's coming for the seed? No. It's not coming for babies. I'm talking about baby Christians now. It's coming for mature Christians. And that's why the Bible calls the second, it calls it an harvest. It's an harvest. And what it's harvesting is harvesting fruits. So God don't expect you and I to remain a baby Christian. We must grow up to, to maturity. The seal of God is also a seal of protection. It is very critical. So those that receive the seal of God are protected throughout the place. Now listen to this. Let, let me, let me uh, explain it to you. When the mark of the beast takes place, the great test, of course, and this is the test that shakes everyone in the world. The remnant it shakes the church, and this test, this examination, will shake some people out. And we are told that majority of Adventists will be shaken out. I'm telling you, we are told the majority will be shaken out. So most of the people we now see that are part of us, the Bible we are, we are told, will be shaken out. And there will be some that remains. And then we are told that there will be others who will hear the message at the 11th hour. And these people, which we call in Babylon, those people we've despised, those people we've looked down on, but the Bible says they will bear the message and they will listen to the loud cry of the, of the fourth angel. And this message will go like white fire. And then we receive the message. And there we join and fill the space of those that have left. Friends, you need to understand. And God is telling you and hi. He has given us a Laodicean message, a straight testimony now. To prepare for that time. Because we, Adventists, have time ahead to prepare. We, we have, we've been having how many years now? Since 1844. To get prepared for that time. But there we only have a short time. To be fully ready. And that is why I believe strongly that those that will really be able to change at that time from Babylon are those that have been faithful to their belief system there. But what they needed to do is just to understand this message uniquely. And they will grab the message like a white fire. But then we are told that God then now what? Put his seal on those that have overcome. Those that pass the test. God plays a seal. And when every faithful believer has been sealed, wicked has been marked for death, then the seven last plagues will begin to fall. This seven last plague will take some time period. It will take some time period. And Christ has finished his work of atonement in heaven. He has lived the what? The temple. Revelation says when this happened, the temple was filled with smoke. You need to understand, friends, your prayers cannot go again. I'm talking about uh, for prayer of forgiveness now. It's not going to the sanctuary again because the work of atonement has ended. 
God has finished his work of intercession. But he doesn't stop the work of what? Of sanctifying. He doesn't stop the work of enabling. God continues to protect his people. And that's why we say the seal of God is a seal of protection or a sign of protection. Because God's people, the kingdom has been made up in heaven. And God seals his people and says, yeah. You remember in Ezekiel, whereby the people there were also what? Sealed or marked. And God sent the angel. That was a, he, sent, he said, go across the city and slay young and old. And leave ex- those that, that has what? The mark or the seal. The same difference. God's seal of protection will be placed on God's people. And probation will close for the world. And the righteous will be protected during this period, which we call Jacob's time of trouble. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the head. So this angel were granted what? To harm the head. And the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till you have sealed what? The servants of our God and their So these angels were supposed to release the winds. The winds in Bible prophecy is a symbol of strife, a symbol of destruction. That is about, let me tell you, the reason why the world is still peaceful like this, because the winds have not been released. The angels, Holy Spirit is still holding the winds. It's still holding the winds. But when the angels release it, we are going to see a time of strife like never before. Daniel calls it, Daniel 12 calls it, he says, a time of trouble such as never was. A time of trouble, you thought uh, those periods we've seen in history, the wars, the first, second world war, you thought it was bad. The Bible says, all of these will pale in comparison to this time. A time of trouble, the revelation calls it the great tribulation. A tribulation that we've never witnessed before. Friends, this time, you better have the seal of God. You better be protected by the seal of God. So God's people will receive. And it says, And I heard the number of them which are sealed. And it says, And there were sealed, what? A hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. When it says tribe of Israel, it's not, it's not talking about the literal Jews now. In the New Testament, when there, there's a shift, when the Bible says Israel, you need to be thinking what? Spiritually. Are you getting it? But the Bible says it's not a Jew who is, who is one outwardly. It's a Jew who is what? what? Inwardly. So here it is not talking about literal Jew. It's talking about spiritual Israelite. These are God's people at the last days. These are God's people at the last days that has washed their robe in the blood of the Lamb. These are God's people at the last days that have said no to the beast and his mark. These are God's people for the last days who has rejected tradition and obey the laws of God. These are God's people who have said, I will stand for God, though the heaven falls. The 144,000. These are the people that are protected at the place. They have on their head the number of God. They have on their head the name of God. They have on their hand, they are protected fully from the place. So don't be confused. So there are a lot of argument about, oh, is it going to be literal? Or is it going to be symbolic? You don't need to bother yourself about literal or symbolic. We know God will have a people that will stand. God will have a people that will overcome the mark of the beast. God will have a, a people that will overcome the image and the number of the beast. And the Bible, the Bible calls them the hundred and forty-four thousand. And the writing is page 71 says, Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble. Now, let me tell you, this 144,000, they don't die. So if you die, you are not part of 144,000. So if you want to be part of these people, you don't die. The 144,000 are those that are alive, translated from among the living. They do not go through the, through the grave. They are not resurrected. They are transformed. They are translated. Oh, the Bible has a lot to say about them. Revelation chapter 14 verse 1 to 2 says, And I looked and lo, a lamb stood among Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, 
having his father's name written on their forehead. They have the character of Christ. They have God's name, Jehovah, written. And I heard a voice from heaven as a voice of many water and as a voice of the great thunder. And I heard a voice of Alpha happening with the harps. And they sang in it as a new song before the throne. They called it the song of Moses in Revelation 15. And before the beasts and the elders, and no man could learn the song for the hundred and forty-four thousand. Amen. They could, no one could learn it because it's the song of their experience. An experience such as never was in the beginning of the world. They went through the most difficult time of the earth history and yet they didn't sing. Wow! They said no one could sing the song but the 144,000. A song of deliverance. A song of overcoming. What a beautiful. Friends, I want to be part of the 144,000, don't you? Wow! It says, which were redeemed from the heads. Just like I said. They were redeemed from the heads, not from the grave. For these are they which were not defied with what? With women. Who are the women? The women in Revelation 17. The harlots and the daughters, right? So they've not been, they, they, they've not, they've not been defied by Babylon. They've not been defied by the, by the intoxicating, intoxicating wine. They've not been defied. They are pure. They are virgins. We're not talking, they are not ladies or ladies or men. It doesn't matter. But as far, they are not part of Babylon. They've left Babylon and rejected its practices and hold on to the true remnant beliefs. And it says, This are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever it goes. Do you follow the Lamb wheresoever you go? Do you follow him even through the difficult times? Do you follow him when it looks impossible or you just shiver at the last minute these ones are not like that they've been converted thoroughly in the pains they've been they, 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 jesus christ the plagues falls they follow jesus christ the sun scorched men they follow jesus christ their hunger they follow jesus christ it doesn't matter what the world asks for them they follow jesus christ do you follow jesus christ they follow jesus wherever he goes these are redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God. The first fruits unto God. First fruits. Because this group of people, they are different. The first generation in the history of mankind to a perfected Christian character. The first fruits. First fruit in quality. First fruits. Don't you want to be part of these people? In their mouth was found no guy. For they are without fault before the throne room of God. The hundred and forty-four thousand. Those are the people that are sealed. Friends, let me tell you this. Don't you, don't you notice something? Have you not studied the book of Revelation 13 before? And when you study the book of Revelation 13, you see the people receiving the mark of the beast. But where are the people that receive the seal of God? Do you find it in Revelation 13? Do you find it there? It's not there. It's not there. The truth of the matter is this. Revelation 14, 1 to 5, ought to be the end of Revelation chapter 13. The, the new chapter should have started from Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Do you understand what I'm saying? So yeah, the Bible is trying to tell us, against these people that receive the mark of the beast, yeah, are the 144,000 that has been sealed. Here are they who stand among Zion that have overcome the beast, his mark, and his number. So the one for the four thousand are the people of God that are sealed. And that is what the Bible is trying to tell us there. God has a message for you and I. He has sent the straight testimony out of love. He gave you the straight testimony to shake your heart. So you can look at yourself again and know where you stand with Jesus. He has given you the straight testimony. Not, not to just detest you, no. It's a message of compassion. It's a message because it loves you and I. It's a message to renew us, to bring us and realize time is short. And in Revelation chapter 18, it says, Babylon the great is fallen. 
is fallen and has become the habitations of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bed. Friends, you need to understand this. It says Babylon has become this. And that's why I pity a lot of uh, Adventists today. They go to those places because they think they are doing some miracles. The Bible says they become the what? The habitations of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and evil bed. Not every miracle you see is a true miracle. You better test the spirits. It says in Isaiah, it says that to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to these words, because there is no light in them. Don't believe all those things. And I tell people, how do you want people to be uh, 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 doing miracles when breaking the Sabbath? It can happen. Lamentation says, the law is no more and the prophet is what? No vision from God. Listen, you can't. That's why the prophet of God, when God gives the prophetic gift to somebody, there must be people that are obeying the what? The laws of God. God cannot give you a prophetic gift when you are breaking one of his law. Because if he gives you, he's endorsing that law, you are breaking. So it's impossible. So they, they have become the habitations of devils and a cage of every unclean and hateful beast. And that's why in Revelation 13, he says this power, they are going to do what? Miracles and signs and wonders. And so you have to get to a point that you don't believe your senses, you believe what the word of God says. Even if a man, a dead man, rise from the dead, and what they are doing is not in line with God, don't believe it. Don't believe your senses. Believe the word of God. And that is what he's saying. It says, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of our fornication. They've drunk the wine of false doctrine. They have given and polluted the world. But God says, and the kings of the earth and have committed fornication with her. But the message is this in verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. God has a people. There are some of us who are not physically in Babylon. Some of us are physically in the remnant church. But our mind is in Babylon. Some of us are, are, are in the right place, but with the wrong mind. It doesn't matter whether you are there physically. God says, Come out of her, my people. Come out of all my people, that ye be not partakers of our sin, and that ye receive not of our place. Have no apology for saying the truth. The word of God is true and sure, and it must make meaning to your heart today. Friends, the question is this. Are you going to be ready at that time when God will seal his people? I want to be sealed. I want to be sealed. I want to be part of those people in the last days that are transferred from among the living and converted among the living. And if God says, if God says it's through the tomb, I don't care. The main thing, I will be with my Lord. And the question is, are you also going to be with God? Friends, just like I said, we are living in unprecedented times. If you are not listening to the news, you better do. Be a watchman. Look at what is happening. Focus your attention on the things that are happening. But most expect, uh, especially, make sure you, what, you are prepared for that period. Time is very short. I don't know how many years we have more. I don't know. Maybe months. I don't know. But the temperature of the world indicates that we are so close to that event. And God wants you and I to stand. God wants to raise you and I to be part of those people that will receive the latter rain. God wants you and I to be part of those people that will give the loud cry. God wants you and I to be part of those people that will give the free angels message. It says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. I want to be part of people that will blow the trumpet. It says, Babylon, Babylon, the great is falling, is falling. I mean, I want to be part of those people. Don't you? Friends, we are the final hour. And I pray that God will help us, will help me, will help you to be ready. And may that be our experience in Jesus' name.